Rampant illiteracy, malnutrition, and lack of infrastructure. This is the story of Wada, one of India's most backward tribal areas. However, since 2010, ecotourism has become a lifeline for this region. Govardhan Eco Village's sustainable development model, which is based on harmony with the self, the environment, and the divine, has helped employ over 300 tribal families. More than 60,000 tribals have been provided free medical care. Thirty thousand free meals are provided to school children every day. Over 60 bore wells have been installed. More than 300 families received training in organic farming. Govardhan Eco Village has transformed the lives of the most deprived communities in the world. Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharani Nirvishishi Shunyavadi Pashchanta Deshtarani Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Vedanta Shri Vasadi Gauravakta Vanda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare A very good morning to all of you and thank you Raji for allowing me this opportunity to share a few words about this wonderful project, Govardhan Eco Village, Sustainability and Yoga. And at the very outset, I must acknowledge that this has been possible thanks to the immense support given by Rajiv, the Basil team, and several other well wishers in Mumbai. India has more than 700,000 villages. In year 1900, the city population of India, it was at 11% and today it has gone up to 32%. At the global level, it has gone up from 13% to 54%. So India still primarily remains a very rural based community. I studied in IIT Mumbai from 89 to 93 and uh, I was giving a talk at MIT a few years ago and one of the professors asked me that you are from IIT, you are supposed to be speaking about technology but we hear you speak about Gita, your dress is very strange, your hairstyle is even more strange. So we don't understand whether you are an engineer, you are a doctor, what are you? So I said, I am a Vedic psychiatrist. <laughs> and I shared with him that I was also in the regular journey. And uh, when I was in my fourth year, there was an incident where one of my colleagues who was in another hostel, he attempted to commit suicide. He was very intelligent, very brilliant boy and I was wondering why did he try to commit suicide and of course fortunately that suicide attempt failed because the rope from which he was trying to hang that broke, you know, it was not a very good quality rope. So he just survived that attempt and I asked him, why did you try to do this? And he said, I'm always used to getting the gold medal in all the exams. And this exam, I got the silver medal, I couldn't handle it. So then that set me thinking that, oh, looks like achievements are not everything, but expectations also play a role in defining the state of experience you go through. And so I realized that actually stress is one of the biggest challenges the world is facing today. And so in the same hospital, in the same college, in the same exam, in my batch, there were four or five of other friends of mine 
and they had failed in four to five subjects and they were moving around the campus peacefully blissfully as if nothing happened because i would expect them to be in anxiety because they had failed in so many subjects but then i asked them you have failed in four or five subjects you are moving around the campus peacefully how is that this other guy other friend of mine he couldn't get the gold medal he's trying to kill himself so it just doesn't make sense to me so these friends of mine very candidly told me that those who had failed in four or five subjects they replied to me that our philosophy in life is very simple entering the college is our job taking us out of the college is college's job <laughs> <laughs> so that was their understanding and philosophy and then i started thinking about that and i realized that yes stress is created due to a gap between expectation and reality and so we find that today the response to stress takes on various ways and methods and there are people every year across the world at least a million teenagers take up to alcoholism due to the influence of anxiety and stress in the 12th standard statistics across the major cities and metros in india 45% of the 12th standard students due to, due to the examination stress they take up to alcoholism and at least we find that 3 to 4000 rupees is the average they are spending on alcohol what is the solution to this anxiety to this stress to the problems being faced within the mind the who defines perfect health as a synergy between body mind and spirit so many times when people ask me are you into spirituality are you into religion i say well from another perspective i am into health and wellness and therefore we are looking at holistic health and holistic health encompasses body mind spirit and the ecology the nature the earth which we are inhabiting this is an extremely crucial point to understand that if we approach the sustainability issue then we have to approach it in a very holistic manner the sustainability issue has to be understood from the perspective of the person whether his life is sustainable or not his thoughts his desires his feelings his thinking is it sustainable and synergistic with his own self with others with family with society and then comes the planet because ultimately what the planet is going through is a net result of the outpouring of what different people are going through within and so we approach this whole issue from the perspective of self transformation and the bhagavad gita is a literature which actually addresses arjuna who was experiencing great stress and depression i was trying to show the bhagavad gita to one gentleman in a local train in mumbai and he looked at me and said how much is this gita for and i said this gita is for 70 rupees he said krishna spoke the gita to arjuna free <laughs> why is kon is charging 70 rupees so i said sir krishna spoke to arjuna in kurukshetra this is mumbai 70 rupees is transport charge <laughs> so many times people feel how can this knowledge make an impact on individuals on economy on ecology and so we have to realize that yes the ancient indian wisdom is powerful by itself but many times what we fail to realize 
is the economic and the ecological ramifications of this wisdom and culture. And these are some of the issues which we will be trying to touch upon in today's discussion. And so coming back to the point that when I was just passing through the IIT, I worked for a few months and at that time I realized that yes, suicide rates is growing across India and today, every single day in India, 371 people commit suicides. They practically lose hope in life. And so I was at the crossroads in life and I thought, let us try to make a difference by helping people transform and heal themselves from within. And so I dedicated my life to improving mental health so that when the mental health improves, the thinking improves, the feeling improves, and so people are able to connect better with themselves, with others, with society, and with environment and ecology. In fact, the education system has become so much information driven that more than the knowledge which people are gaining many times, people are into the education system just trying to fulfill someone else's dream. The word education comes from the Latin word educari, which means to bring out that which is within. And so, I remember one of my friends went for a conference. He took the business card of one of the persons who was attending there. And his name was there and below the name his educational qualification was written. PhD BF. So he got bewildered. What is this educational qualification? He said, PhD but fail. <laughs> he said, my God, what does this mean? He said, well, my father wanted me to do a PhD because my cousin was a PhD, my neighbor was a PhD, so and so was a PhD. And therefore, under social pressure, you know, I had to register. But after two years, I realized that I'm not up to it. And so I quit. But then, you know, there was pressure that I must attend various conferences and this and that. And while attending conference below the name of PhD is not there, people think you are gate crashing. So therefore I had to be honest, I added PhD, BF, but honestly speaking, most people think this BF is a qualification beyond PhD. <laughs> You're the first person who's asking all the details. So is it not a fact that, you know, we dedicate so much of our time, energy in education, in careers, but we fail to realize that a lot of our decisions are driven by other considerations like peer pressure, like social issues, which are not even brought to the surface for a threadbare discussion. In Mumbai, there is this five-star hotel, hotel president, right? And then, you know, you need to be able to afford to be able to eat there. And so only a certain section of society can manage to participate and experience that. Just outside hotel president, there was this hawker who was very ingenious. He was out of box thinking. And he put up his hand, hand cart, what they call in Hindi, thela. And he started selling samosa, just outside hotel president. And he gave it the name hotel vice president. <laughs> and his marketing pitch was, if you can't afford the president, come to the vice president. <laughs> and so, a lot of our life is spent around dealing with comparisons, anxiety arising out of this. And therefore, if you ask people, you know, why don't you come to, come for such a discussion? And they say, very busy. And many people typically say in India, papi pet ka sawal hai. But actually speaking, the real issues are beyond all this. And therefore, yes, we could discuss a lot about sustainability and we are going to discuss. But most importantly is we are addressing how 
we can manage and control our own emotions and our own selves first and then based on that everything else follows so in in fact the govardhan eco village is what i call as harmonizing emotions environment and economy and so we have out of the population of 1.2 crore you know 120 crore population in india we have approximately 82 crore living in the villages but around 40 crore those who are in the cities don't want to have anything to do with the village so we thought okay how do we attract city dwellers attention to the village so we thought we have to create something which a person from the city will feel is relevant for me in a village because people in the city are always thinking what is in it for me so we thought yes city has prosperity but city also has anxiety so let us create a wellness retreat center with yoga ayurveda and facilities for people to stay in comfortable rooms because people from the city are interested to some extent or inquisitive about the village but many times scared to actually go and stay and live in a real village so we had to create city comfort within a village so that's what the govardhan eco village is all about we have created a retreat center with city comfort in a village with wellness programs which is going to attract tourists and people from the cities but then when people get healed and get transformed then they start inquiring what are you doing in the village around so then we have also adopted more than 30 villages and we are interfacing with the local villagers trying to transform their lives and therefore we have created a very amazing rural development program around and that is what i call harmonizing economy so therefore we exist to help the community around us those from the city come heal their emotions they will pay you know 1 dollar anywhere they go but when they pay a dollar here then practically all of it goes for transforming the villages around us and therefore transforming emotions transforming economy but harmonizing in a way that the environment around is not affected a lot with minimum impact on the environment we have tried to intervene so therefore harmonizing environment so therefore with that background i'll take you through briefly our presentation we are located in wada taluka govardhan eco village is in wada taluka in maharashtra it is a very prominently tribal area and here in a village called galtare we started in 2003 with just five of our volunteers and a few cattle and now we have grown up to 250 strong community who are staying within includes farmers cattle rearers devotees monks and more than 100 cattle we have and so as we are thinking about the concept so we had to consider all aspects of living many of you may be aware that yes when we speak about sustainability the story of delhi is very prominent and the air quality index as defined by who in the index of 0 to 50 is considered to be very good quality and when it goes in the range of 300 to 400 is considered very poor quality last year in delhi many of you must have heard that the air quality index it went up to 378 in the period of november december and went up to 999 on one day to the extent that an india sri lanka cricket match had to be stalled for some time interrupting cricket is serious business <laughs> so many times people felt climate change is not for india but then you saw the masks which people were wearing around and you realized it is there for real 
And so, United Nations has decided to organize every year, December 5th, as the International Smog Day. And so, because of the poor air quality, which was equivalent to smoking 50 cigarettes, we find that every year, 9 million people die prematurely due to poor air quality. And out of this, 2.5 million are in India itself. And therefore, we cannot say that, yes, climate change is something which is only there for the West and not for India. No, it's very much a part of the Indian ethos also now. So, so we thought, okay, if we are going to intervene in a village which is pure, pristine, absolutely clear in terms of environmental purity, why do we want to intervene? We want to intervene because we want to attract the attention of people from across the world to the situation of villages in India and also their attention to our ancient wisdom. Since time immemorial, great sages and saints, they would always prefer going to mountains, forests and very secluded places to experience peace. So that is the natural option for us to go. So yoga is defined as a state of harmony amongst all the aspects of living. Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita, Trividam naraka sedam dwaram nashanam atmana kamam krodam tatha lobham tasmat etat trayam tajet. That there are three aspects within every human being which disrupt our harmony. <coughs> Kama, which is lust, krodha, anger, lobha, which is greed. They are constantly displacing our peace and creating anxiety. I was doing a program in Yeravada jail in Pune many years ago. An assistant commissioner of police was a close friend of mine and he wanted me to speak to the prisoners. 500 hardcore prisoners were there in the audience in front of me. Sometimes I like the jail programs very much because the audience is guaranteed. <laughs> so as I was giving a lecture, you know, after I gave my talk, one of the prisoners raised his hand and he said, I have a question. I said, go ahead and ask. He said, I want to come on the stage and ask the question. So I turned to the assistant commissioner of police next to me and said, why does he want to come on the stage? Who is he? So the commissioner said, he has committed 12 murders. So I said, am I going to be 13? Why does he want to come on the stage? There's no, no problem, let him come. So he came on the stage and he, he made his big question, philosophical point and this and that. And after that I asked him, how come at such a young age you landed up in the jail? And he said, I have anger issues. And when I'm overwhelmed by anger, it becomes a blind spot. I can't see anything. But somehow, here in the jail, I have been given the task of translating into Braille language a very interesting book, Bhagavad Gita as it is. So that's what he was doing at that time. But the fact is that yes, yoga is meant to try to create harmony within. And so these are the four human needs which all of us go through which in our traditional Vedic paradigm is called Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. So if you see the traditional setup in India, the world has 29 agroclimatic zones and India has 21 out of those. And in India, more than 1635 languages get spoken. So the way India is set up is pretty unique, but somehow, if you compare in 2011, the FMCG industry was close to $30 billion, and in 2018, it has gone up to $74 billion. 
So traditionally, we were meant to reflect holistically as far as our life is concerned with all of these considerations, dharma, ecological or self-sustainability, environmental, economical, self-sufficiency, karma, social self-worth and cultural self-realization or moksha. But when we give up these principles, give up these thoughts, then things go out of control. And so when we speak about climate change today, globally the CO2 emissions way back in 1900 was at 2 billion tons. And now it has grown up in 2015 to 36 billion tons. And so across the world, the annual CO2 emissions is highest by China at 10,000 million tons. Second highest by US at more than 5,500 million tons. Third is by EU and fourth is India at around 2,300 million tons. And therefore, as we are getting into this consumption model, we have to be very clear that eco-village is a place where we have to harmonize our inner ecology with the external ecology. And eco-village design is about creating an ecosystem for life. If you see the global fossil fuels consumption pattern, that we have only 114 years more remaining for the coal deposits. Natural gas, 53 years. Oil, 51 years more. Time is running out. And if you consider between 1800 to 2015, the overall fossil fuel consumption has gone up by 1800 times. And so, somewhere we have to understand that yes, the origin of creating the pattern of sustainability has to begin from self-control. And so, we thought, okay, if we have to create and design this eco-village, let's rethink the paradigm. Let us not consider nature to be an infinite source of supply and also an infinite dumping paradigm where we can go on dumping our waste forever and Mother Nature will go on absorbing it. And typically in modern times, the consumeristic society with the numbers which I just shared with you, thinks that there is an infinite possibility of dumping all the wastes. And so every resource goes through a certain system by the consumer and converts into a waste. So all we have is a linear resource to trash model. We thought if we are creating an eco-village in Galdare village in the midst of rural Maharashtra, we have to do something different. We have to establish this eco-village on the principles of the ancient Indian wisdom which is holistic, which is not linear, which is cyclical. And therefore, we thought the ecosystem thinking should be brought about, which is that every system as a consumer, when it consumes a resource, whatever waste it produces, that waste should become the input for the next system. We should design an eco-village in a way that every waste becomes a resource or an input for the next system so that total we have a zero waste eco-village. That is what our whole thinking pattern was and as I have realized everything begins with the concept, with the thought and so we are happy that we actually managed to create an eco-village where just imagine initially you see this beautiful cartoon which has been created, graphics. We have this cow, so the cow is eating grass and the cow eats grass and produces dung. If you just leave the cow and nature, 
They are made for each other. The cow eats grass, gives the dung, and that cow dung is a fertilizer for the grass. And then cow eats grass, gives the dung. It can go on forever. And then you can say they lived happily ever after. As soon as you bring in human beings, so then you need agriculture. So that cow dung we used for creating cow dung and cow urine based fertilizers and pesticides. Then the human beings need a place to live. So that house is built with mud bricks. Then you need energy. So that energy is from the sun, which we get a lot. Then we need to cook. So for the cooking, we need fuel. So the cow dung based biogas plants we could create. So that goes in as a fuel. What comes out is waste. So we decided let's have a soil biotechnology plant, which will process more than two crore liter of water every year. That comes out what is known as fish fit water and that again goes back. And so all the plastic waste is processed through what we have created, what is known as a plastic pyrolysis plant. It creates plastic into diesel. Then we have the construction waste which we use for permanent raised bed for our agriculture. We have our food waste that also goes into the solid biotechnology plant. In this way, we are happy to share that we managed to design an eco-village which is zero waste, absolutely zero waste. All of the waste is processed. And so we thought eco-village construction is not about creating building, but creating living spaces. So therefore, when the Lehman Brothers, you know, shook the whole world way back in 2007, at that time, over the next two, three years, it was found that economies across the world is going down. But the Indian economy was going up. And so it intrigued a few economists and one of the top professors in Harvard, he actually published a paper that how is India's economy going up? And he called this concept Jugad. And for those of you who are from India and who know this word, Jugar, I call it a non-translatable word. You have to be an Indian to understand what it means. To some extent, you can say out-of-box thinking. Right? And therefore, we have the capacity for this out-of-box thinking because unless you think out-of-the-box and innovate, you cannot really change the existing paradigm. I was on a flight from Mumbai to Calcutta with two of my friends from America. We landed in Calcutta airport. I had a program at Kharagpur IIT, which is a three hour drive. When I landed, I heard that it is Bengal Band that day. And when Bengal Band, they take it very seriously. They do not allow any vehicles to move. So when I came... <laughs> That was quite amazing. And as we were entering into the ambulance, my friends from America were bewildered. They asked me, why are we going in an ambulance? I said, very difficult to explain. But don't worry, people may throw stones here and there, but even if they do, we are in the right vehicle, the ambulance. At one point, you know, people were really very serious. They wanted to see who's behind. They said, no, we want to check who's behind. I was sitting in front giving prasad and they said, no, we want to see who's behind. So they came and looked behind and my two friends who had been welcomed with garlands after taking breakfast, they were sleeping peacefully behind. So this guy looked inside and said, Inki Atma ko shanti mile. May their souls rest in peace. Move ahead. And within three hours we reached Karakpur. So therefore, you know, I really appreciate out of box thinking or innovation. And sometimes really amazing things happen when we feel, yes, we should not be hopeless, there can be a solution to this if we think deeply enough and out of the box. So therefore, we thought, okay, let's look at alternative construction technologies. And so we were introduced to what is known as the mud blocks. What you see is a compressed, stabilized mud, mud blocks. CSEB. 
and this compressed stabilized mud, mud blocks has only around 7 to 8% cement, 3% limestone and it is comprised of the local mud and if you compare with the regular brick wall and the brick wall which has cement, plaster and paint it consumes 72 megajoules per kilogram of embodied energy but a wall made out of compressed stabilized earth blocks the embodied energy compared to the 72 megajoules is 0.275 megajoules per kilogram so that is a kind of embodied energy saving which we actually make by creating these mud blocks and when we first conceived of this concept I could not go ahead and create buildings all across because we are part of an NGO, a trust, we are part of ISKCON and so everything needs to be vetted by the larger community and so we made one building and when people came and saw that one building they were touching this blocks and saying hey will it melt, will it break, you know what will happen so well since time immemorial people have been creating buildings with mud and there is no problem at all and in fact there is very very little maintenance because you don't have to keep redoing with paints and plaster and things like that and therefore this is how the overall look and feel of the mud block buildings is so we have created more than 150,000 uh, square feet of construction with this kind of thing as far as the mud block is concerned and so it is said that the construction industry is responsible very predominantly for the overall global warming and it is described one interesting statistics I have is that the five warmest summers which the world has experienced since 1500 have all happened after 2003 and in fact in 2003 Europe experienced such a heat wave that more than 2000 people actually died and therefore not only the impact of global warming is in the lifestyle but also various kinds of diseases like malaria increase because the malarial parasite not only you know the malaria itself grows uh, the mosquitoes itself breed more when things become warmer but the malarial parasite for every one degree increase in the temperature the malarial parasite it expands itself 10 times more and therefore it is described by 2050 if the global warming continues the way it is more than 5 billion people across the world are going to be impacted by malaria and these are all figures which I have obtained from United Nations uh, connections because today you will be happy to know that just 10 days ago Govardhan Eco Village was accredited to United Nations Environment Assembly and we have been invited to participate in the global environmental policy making and therefore if you compare the 2018 CO2 uh, you know fraction in the whole atmosphere it is 400 ppm parts per million by 2100 it is expected to grow from 400 to 1000 ppm and so it is very clear that this is going to decrease the human cognition by more than 21 percent and the impact is there for all of us to see and not only that as half a degree temperature rises the possibilities of wars and conflicts increase by 10 to 20 percent and so this is a very very crucial thing to ex understand and experience and what we believe is just going through and experiencing the problem is not sufficient how you communicate the problems complexity and the possible solution is equally important and therefore we thought if we simply show powerpoints about statistics about 
how the world is going through this and that and this and that people may or may not take seriously we want them to communicate through a built space that yes you please come here stay here experience what it means to have an intervention which is sustainable in nature and therefore this is a very important response called climate change adaptation a vedic perspective my dear friend rajendra singh who is known as the waterman of india and who won the stockholm water prize which is considered to be the nobel prize for water so he actually conducted an entire you know seminar on this and he is very very inspired by the eco village and he made this particular you know statement that govardhan eco village is basically climate change adaptation from a vedic <coughs> perspective so the communication is very important and so we decided to use this language to communicate the urgency and importance of understanding how unsustainable personal lives unsustainable value systems and unsustainable thoughts greed and consumption patterns are the basic root cause for lack of sustainability in nature and in climate around i give the example that you know one time a cola company decided that they will do marketing of their cola in middle east so they were doing this huge marketing campaign they had this ad campaign where they had three sections in the ad in the first section they showed that here is a person who is riding on a camel in the middle of a desert the sun is beating upon his head he is looking very morose because of the heat then the second ad showed that he gets hold of this cola starts drinking it then the third section of the ad showed after drinking he is blissful is <coughs> transformed and this was splashed all across the middle east but the cola sales were not in, improving increasing and someone said this is middle east they read arabic right to left not left to right <laughs> so they are all processing this ad right to left they are seeing the guy is blissful gets sold of the cola becomes morose so it is opposite so you may have a great message but if you do not communicate that message appropriately it doesn't make a difference and therefore we thought okay not only about built spaces but the most crucial aspect of any living entity is water yes we should not just be concerned with consuming that water but how we create water security for the village by improving the consistency of the water source in the village itself thank you varun sir now this time could you welcome kishida uh, with a few words of introduction to conduct the uh, the moderated q and a for the next about half an hour or so uh, <coughs> kishida mikami is a dedicated environmentalist educationist and business woman She served as the founding executive director of the Singapore Environment Council. is a community in bloom ambassador and was awarded the president's award for environment in Singapore. She is devoted to empowering our youth through education and believes that the mother of all learning is doing. She serves on the board of numerous educational institutions including the UWC Southeast Asia Foundation. Her expertise lies in strategic fundraising and creating sustainable scalable programs once raising over 100 million dollars for SMU's endowment fund kitty is a lifelong learner who pursues self development and enrichment so could i please request all of you to put your hands together welcome kitty thank you a very good afternoon and uh, thank you for inviting me to present uh, this uh, talk that you gave and the inspiration behind the eco village is just phenomenal so i will quickly jump into the first question uh, the eco village is an outcome of your personal journey your personal doing what motivated you or what were your eureka moments for you to move into uh, nurturing 
nature as one says, which nurtures us. So where did it begin? So I would like to know where those little touch points in your younger days, what influenced you? Uh, honestly speaking, the main inspiration came from Radhanath Swami and uh, this was a project which, you know, ISKCON at Chopati wanted to do right from 1988. So from 88 to 95, we searched for more than 300 pieces of land. Then we got one plot of land on the outskirts of Pune in a place called Dong. And there we had 50 acres. We developed it for four years. Then unfortunately, this is quite amazing, that there were a group of people who were very much practitioners, but they were villagers. They staged a walkout in protest against organic farming. Because they said, our fathers, forefathers have always been doing chemical farming. And therefore, we find it difficult to believe that organic farming can still yield productivity. And they had a difference of opinion. Of course, I was not involved in those days, I just joined. Then 2000 to 2003, again we searched for another two, 300 pieces of land. Then sold this land in Don and purchased this new land, 25 acres. Then for another six, seven years it was going on and already the enthusiasm was low because the previous project had failed. So even the you know finance team or other congregation, not the monks inside were too much enthusiastic. That's why if you see the original when we showed the slide of the original numbers, it was only five. Right? Then in 2009, Radhanath Swami started saying that we must give priority to this. So actually from the time I joined in 95, I've been working, 93, I've been working closely with Radhanath Swami. Just like in corporate, you know, when a team goes, when that CEO leaves or he takes his team with him to another place and another place. So like that also, we have been working together on many projects at Chopati and then finally when he decided to focus here. So, well, I always thought that I have given away my, as you know, my engineering karma is finished after I joined ISKCON. Because I'm just doing lecturing, you know, Bhagavad Gita and all that. But looks like Krishna still had some place for my engineering karma. So therefore, you never know when your skills will be used. So in 2009 when I got involved, that's where, you know, all those things still came back. So then in 2009, there was no money and no priority given. So one of the monks had saved some money to give to his family before he joined. He donated two lakhs out of that so that I could travel around India to search for architects. And then from then we finalized this architect. And so therefore, at the beginning, there was too much of uncertainty because of the previous background also. And in general, the enthusiasm to do anything in a village is not very high, even within our community there, initially. So now things are changing. That's very profound. They say perseverance pays. And as you said rightly, it's the communication skills. And investing in communication skills, the two, two, two lakh rupees, being put there was very, very utilized. Um, you're a builder of communities, you're a nurturer of communities. And uh, as one, as this is one of my greatest beliefs, is when you nurture nature, nature nurtures us. And uh, in this whole presentation that I saw, you have managed soil, water, air, and looking at energy. And when you have managed these three very important ingredients, the, the land there is thriving and and doing well. And in itself, it is a multiplier effect. The whole village, the eco-village has sprung up. So sometimes, you know, you have to be very strategic. Mother Nature teaches us that when you nurture her, she nurtures us. Could you expand on that? Uh, how have you been able to, uh, the kind of different approaches that you took, uh, what worked, what didn't work, so that, you know, you just get an insight into what you, how you did it. Yeah, so 
basically when we began we realized that we have to focus on making sustainable impact and uh, sustainable impact meant that everything had to tie into each other so many times when you go for isolated items which do not connect then it doesn't work that's piecemeal approach piecemeal approach doesn't work so therefore we had to be very strategic and more importantly we had to make sure that the solution which we choose is not bigger than the original problem because sometimes when you intervene you can leave behind a bigger carbon footprint like when the british were active in india during the british rule at that time there is a true story that there was a big problem with the cobras in delhi so the the british government came up with a scheme that anyone who brings a skin of the cobra and gives it to the government officials they will be given 5 rupees so they thought this will encourage people to catch the cobras and bring but what unfortunately happened was the british made the scheme thinking in the british way they didn't figure out the indian way so what actually happened was farmers around delhi started creating farms <laughs> to increase cobra population <laughs> they looked at it as a business model <laughs> jugad so the cobra started growing so the british realized that this is what is going on so they said we are calling off this scheme when they called off the scheme the farmers became angry released all the cobras in the city so therefore sometimes solution is bigger than the problem so therefore we had to make sure that all of it is tied in so many times ngos they do not actually uh, decide to hire experts because they are always research crunched so one advice or one experience which we would like to share is whatever may happen always go in for expertise in that particular field we are ex- our expertise as is called is in spiritual field not environmental field but we manage to hire people who are experts in environmental field and more importantly we manage to remain humble to follow what they are saying because many times when you are into philosophy you think you can advise everybody including those who are experts in environment so we manage to remain humble and plus we had a group of monks who were all ex engineers iit and this that who felt that they know better than the architects so managing all of that was a crucial uh, important element in this a very uh, interesting point you had made about recycling uh, the whole planet if we see is a recycling planet everything here including us we are all recycled and only our souls are traveling that's what the philosophy says and uh, you have really embraced the recycling in a very systematic way uh, what were the challenges uh, to implement and get the villagers to adopt it because there's always this thing you know the grass looks greener on the other side in the in the cities they do this in the towns they do this how did you inspire the villagers because you are creating a community which is to be living sustainably you have to buy their you know confidence you have to buy their uh, uh, willingness and it has to be a collective so creating this whole community <coughs> if you could share one or two good examples there see uh, we started off with a advantage being spiritual organization and in india the emotions are still very positive for many of these activities so the first thing is we started satsang programs geeta lectures kirtans yoga programs for the villagers around to develop a relationship because many times people feel we can do any change in village by putting money no it doesn't work like that in india that you may be anybody but till the villagers allow you to make the intervention and transformation nothing can be done so the first priority was we became part of the village and then when we became part of the village through all of these interventions then we started sharing with them gradually when we got accepted 
that yes, this is what we are doing and just see how you can also participate. So I remember during when the construction was going on, you know, it was May of 2011 and typically April, May is like uh, Shadi ka season and many of the people, you know, they disappear to their village. So we had at that point a uh, one particular site in the eco village which we were developing and uh, we, there was this truck contractor from the local village and the truck contractor came up to me and he said that all my drivers have gone off to the village and there is nobody to drive this truck but because this is such a crucial project and it is you know a temple project therefore mandir ka kaam band nahi hona chahiye so that proprietor he would come in his innova take out his clothes in a banyan and he would personally drive the truck and he did that for one week till the drivers returned back and they did not allow that work to stop so when the sympathy is there goodwill is there then all other things follow so you've invested in people first before you invest in the ideas very important because we learn from the first mistake where our own people who are inside we try to put organic farming down their throats without having to exp you know explain to them in great detail so we paid for that um, we all are driven by some values i remember swamiji also mentioned and uh, so we call it there are spiritual values there are certain values i call it the moral compass so sometimes it's a north west south east so i say inward looking you say mindfulness or awareness external skillfulness empathy meditation, reflection, introspection. So these are kind of things with which you are churning your life to make yourself a better human being. And once those are rooted in you, then you are able to influence and impact others. So you have to first live it and then you can influence others. So could you share your moral compass with me? Our moral compass is very uh, <coughs> simple. Service without selfish considerations. And therefore, when we begin with this idea, we serve, we exist so that we can serve without selfish considerations, then it is possible for us to go through various challenges and difficulties. So therefore, I say that effectiveness of a decision is equal to the quality of the decision multiplied by acceptance square. And many times the acceptance is affected by how people perceive your intention to be selfish or selfless or how it is. Like for example in Las Vegas, you know, they found, this is a true story in a hospital, they found that in the ICU, deaths were happening before time of terminally ill patients. They did a whole investigation and found out that nurses had got addicted to gambling in their free time, Las Vegas. And so they had got so habituated to gambling that even in the ICU, they started gambling which patient will go first, bed number 12 or bed number 13, and they were putting money on that. And when they found that they were losing on it, they started switching off the life support systems. So therefore, many times you may think, how is moral values and all this connected to, you know, other people's lives? It's all my own thing. No, it percolates and it has an impact. This is very crucial. Speaking of sustainable practices, you have applied a lot of things here. And is, there's a vision for you to make it a center for excellences. Are you looking into uh, supporting or looking at different new innovative practices? Because you come with the engineering background sciences because even in your water you pick the best you, you went into taking the scientific opinion and then the spiritual part of it. so are there any new innovations are there any uh, upcoming things that you're applying because this model looks fantastic and the key is about scalability right how are we going to scale this yes because a one village may not solve our problems but the scalability is important so 
is this is going to be a center for learning in which that the, 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 cent, the, the uh, institute has been set up. So if you could shed some light on what are the future aspirations, so right. we can all kind of plug into it and get more involved. So uh, being an NGO, we are currently focused on setting uh, a, an excellent example there. But through these forums, we share what we have done with others to inspire and ignite interest. Because each one of you is connected to some village or a group of villages somewhere. So basically, if we are able to spark that interest amongst you, then we have all the know-how, all the technology, all our own experiences. Because unfortunately, in developing land, every piece of land is unique. It is biodiversity dependent, the soil type dependent, the climate dependent, and therefore you just cannot take something and transplant it somewhere else as it is. But we have the principles, we have our experience of our application. So there has been tremendous interest from the bureaucrats, from the ministries, you know, uh, Chandra Babu Naidu's uh, tourism minister, he reached out to me and he said, we want something near Amravati. And then, you know, from Gurgaon, from Haryana, they came said, said, we should have something there. Urissa government reached out. So a lot of such state governments are reaching out. But at this stage, we are quite focused on completing our vision. And maybe with the inspiration and help of corporates like all of you who can help us scale this up or create a model by which this can be incubated in other places, maybe things can be done. In fact, Rajiv is uh, planning a retreat on the 12th and 13th of January of next year. 11th evening check-in and then 12th and 13th of January, Saturday, Sunday, there is a retreat planned for those who are all connected to Artha Forum from Singapore, Silicon Valley, Middle East, Mumbai, Radhanath Swami, Ajay Piramal and a few others are going to come together and take you through a beautiful retreat where we will have various conversations and maybe in such kind of occasions, it's possible for us to understand how to take this. One thing we are definitely scaling up is, you know, I was just uh, sharing that from with all the farmers we have connected, all the food products, the grains, the pulses, the nuts which we are taking. So then we have created in Bhivandi a 5,000 square feet plant where we are processing all of this in a natural way and we have created our brand called Hari Bowl Products. Hari Bol is our, you know, chant. Right. So Hari Bol is now, you know, started its operations, and we have begun with Hari Bol milk and all of this food within Maharashtra and India, and maybe in another few months we will be exporting all of this quality product. Iskon is already famous for, you know, cooked food, but now first time we are entering into the space of raw food, processed food, you know, processing plant where we want to do this. So we want to support the farmers by cutting out all the middlemen concept and helping like that. We urbanites are creatures of comfort. We would come there for a week and get inspired and you know, help out and get inspired. But we want some four or five nuggets from you. So we bring back all these ideas or these ways of living in this city urban environment so that we consistently can stay connected to the sustainability uh, platform or the connection with ourselves. So if you could give us four or five good nuggets that we as urbanites can embrace and consistently evolve in our journeys. Sure. I call it the ABCD formula. You know, because you need something to remember. So A stands for association. Association means you connect with those who are like-minded and uh, you know who are very uh, similar in thinking, who are also looking at transformation, self-development, whichever way you want to put it. Because that A, association, creates all the difference. Depending on whom you associate, how you associate, your whole thinking pattern will practically change. So that's first A. B stands for books. 
you know there are a lot of books available on development self development from ancient wisdom to modern contemporary those who have commented on that wisdom presenting things in a very contemporary fashion so those are books c stands in our parlance for chanting or you can call it contemplation because depending on what you have gone through if you take out some quality time every day for yourself for your own transformation you know you have to invest i say that you cannot get good health just by imagining you are going to improve you have to invest time for exercise so like that you invest time on a daily basis for some kind of what i call as the mental treadmill so therefore the chanting is like the treadmill for the mind or the meditation some meditation and today after the yoga wave the next huge wave which is going to impact the world is in the next 10 years meditation is going to be really big and therefore how you can actually connect to this space in meditation transformation and d stands for diet you know although i was brahmachari but somehow you know by the lord's arrangement because we had to improve our kitchens and everything so we landed up doing lot of cooking and radhana swami is a very popular spiritual teacher so lots of people come so as a result i landed up cooking more than 3 million meals for the last 10 years you know so i seen how the impact of diet can create change in consciousness so diet is very closely linked to consciousness and therefore following this a b c d is very crucial and uh, you know i have my cousin here subha everybody knows most of you know him but i didn't know that he is so uh, closely connected to the yoga world and when my news of this visit to singapore got public then he reached out to me and i found out that he's also into some kind of yoga and you know running a resort satwa for yoga and transformation so therefore and and we are meeting after like almost uh, 30 years when he was in iit i had met him so therefore i would say that you know these are some of my tips as far as transformation is concerned and you know i would like to conclude with a small story that in our you know temples sometimes during festivals we have 3 4000 people who come and when 3 4000 people are standing in line for prasadam they are in anxiety will we get or not but sometimes more anxiety is for those who are serving and they start giving limited quantity wanting to save for themselves and then people complain are kya ye sabji chutney ki tarah de raha hai telling to serve more so how do you remove the insecurity we make the plate for the serving volunteer in advance and keep it right next to him so that as the serving is going on if he is in anxiety he keeps looking <laughs> if i continue serving my future is bright <laughs> then they start giving double and triple their whole performance changes and people are receiving the prasadam they look at the profuse quantities they are getting and tell the guys who are serving are save something for yourself also and the guy responds are seva is the goal of life <laughs> So how that transformation in attitude happens when they see that what I am investing in will bring definite returns. So when people think investing in one's own personal development will bring returns at all levels, why won't people do that? On that note, I will ask. Uh, I think some, we'll take some questions from the floor.
Yeah, see, definitely you have, you have to appreciate that when you are looking at organic farming, then first of all, organic farming must be viewed from the perspective of the holistic impact on the soil and the kind of long-term impact we are going to have. So when you have NPK-based farming, not only at that particular place where the farming is going on, that soil is affected. But you must remember in Konkan, we get 3000 millimeters of rain every year. So July to September, profuse rain. And where does that rain water surface runoff go? Many of that percolate inside. And so other places where farming is not going on, that rainwater carries these chemicals, percolates the groundwater, pollutes the aquifers. And then if you have put your hand pump there, all of that, you know, contaminated water is drunk by the people. And then you have arsenic poisoning and you have other kinds of effects. So therefore, we should not look at things only in isolation in that specific location, but the overall impact has to be seen. So yes, there are examples of very amazing productivity through organic farming, but at the same time, because as I said, it is not like Microsoft has created a software and it can be replicated everywhere because it is machine-based. Here, it is earth-based. Earth is living. So you create a formula by which something works in this soil, it cannot work in another place. It has to be uniquely identified and understood there. So the dynamism involved creates the challenges. Because unfortunately or fortunately, it's not just one technology. It's not like a bulb, oh, I manufacture it here, I can manufacture and export it globally. But if it is calibrated, then it can get. Yes, so that would require due diligence, patience, willingness to go through tr trials. But if all of us are determined and persevere with the true north, that yes, this is the direction we will go in. Once those basic attitudes are framed commonly, then other things are detailed. But we are trying to share this so that people can have a wake-up call that should we even alter the true north or not. That's the whole idea. Hi, uh, my name is Rahul, and uh, first of all, thank you so much, Arta Forum, for inviting me here. Every time I come here, I go knowledgeable. Not sure wiser, but definitely knowledgeable. And in fact, uh, one of the previous occasions I was here, that's when I first met your cousin, who is sitting right beside me right now. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, as you pointed out, uh, even Mahatma Gandhi said that uh, the soul of India lives in villages. And what you have demonstrated is that not just soul, but the knowledge of India also lives in villages. Now, most of us here do know about this knowledge. Like, for example, we do know that if you fertilize the soil with cow dung, it becomes more productive. Sun is the source of energy. The banana leaf plate are environmentally friendly. Now, we know all this, but what is it that prevents us from, despite knowing this knowledge, from, able to, from being able to implement it in a practical fashion that you have been able to do? So what I'm saying is, the tagline for Artha is also uh, ancient wisdom, modern businesses. So why is it that ancient business, uh, ancient knowledge that lives in our villages or in our scriptures, we're not able to live with, we're not able mm -hmm. to make it practical? Thank you. You, you studied in India only? Uh, yes and no. So I did my undergrad here in Singapore in NTU, okay. and I did my MBA in uh, India in IIM. Okay. Well, in 1947, when uh, we got the independence. So just after that, we were declared, you know, one of the aspects was secularism. So there could be various ways in which secularism can be defined. One of the ways in which it was defined and implemented was no study or dissemination of religion or spirituality in any of the, you know, educational institutions. Right? So you will be uh, happy to know that American Academy of Religion is an institution which was created in 1963 and American Academy of Religion has more than 10,000 PhDs in religion 
and across the world religious studies is a regular program available in across all universities and colleges right every november american academy of religion does conferences where people come together so the population of the world is 7 billion christians are 31% muslims are 23% the third highest number is 16% of agnostics skeptics atheists which means they can go anywhere or nowhere fourth largest is 15% hindus but there is only one country in the whole world where you cannot do a phd in religion that is india okay so anyway things are changing and i am happy to share with those Who would like to meet me personally on this? That after a lot of effort on the last one to two year uh, from 2012, one aspect of Gordon Eco Village which I didn't share publicly in my presentation was we are running a Bhakti Vedanta Vidya Peet for training in traditional Indian wisdom, including Bhagavatam and Gita, at the Eco Village, and now we have branches across in Mumbai also. So just last month in September. We had the Honorable Education Minister Sri Vinod Tawde Ji and Ajay Premal Radhanath Swami together, and we are happy to uh, announce that Bhakti Vedanta Vidya Peet Research Center has been achieving eight PhDs every year in traditional Indian philosophy and religion. <laughs> so, in fact, you know, uh, I met Dr. Charles a couple of years ago at our uh, Jopati Temple, and we were discussing this. so the the answer is basically the way religion spirituality has been branded and prioritized in the last 50 60 years and you must go back if you see paul byroch famous belgian economist so he has written a very fantastic paper and book on the thinking that india is a poor country hear this in ad 1 india's contribution to the world's gdp was more than 36% by ad 1000 it came to around 32% then after the moguls started coming in over 1500 ad it came down to 28% and then british influence began 1800 AD India's GDP contribution to the world was 16%. Then Macaulay became active. Then he saw that okay, all of this prosperity is primarily because of their traditional education system, which is village based and very personalized. And therefore, they systematically worked to break that. And then at that time, India had the greatest number of trading ships in the whole world which were several times the size of the european ships laws were passed to make sure that no trading can happen with the indian ships and the entire ship building industry was brought to its knees so from 1800 further to 1900 1900 ad india's gdp contribution to the world became 1% and at the time of independence in 1947 it was 3% so the interest the important point is not this okay one point is yes we were the wealthiest country among the wealthiest country in the whole world for more than 1800 years okay nobody remembers that that is one point <coughs> but the more important point is when we were the economic superpower across the whole world for 1800 years we were also the socially most harmonious country in the world without having divorce rates like we find in places in europe more than 70% america 50% first divorce case in india was reported in newspaper because it was a news ki aisa bhi hota hai there is a phenomenon and today the divorce rate in india is at 14% but try to understand that we demonstrated that economic prosperity is possible with individual and social and ecological harmony that was our contribution 
So therefore, the greatest amount of research in Sanskrit is not happening in India. It is happening in Germany. It is happening in America. Because many have realized what is the power which is hidden within our scriptures. So well, when Indians decide to prioritize something, they can create miracles. It is just that at a certain point in history, we have lost focus on the priority. And therefore, if we reprioritize and understand that education system is not just about mugging and cranning, like typical you know scenario in a house, father is teaching the son mathematics. Father is telling the son, beta, 9 into 8 is how much? The son says, 78. Father says, very good, take this cookie. The father's friend says, hey, this is nonsense. 9 into 8 is 72. He said, 78, you are rewarding him. He learned wrong mathematics. Father says, I asked the boy, same thing yesterday. 9 into 8. Yesterday he said, 88. <laughs> Today he has come to 78. In a few days he has come to 17. I have no choice. What can I do? So therefore, either I become angry, want him to become Einstein or Newton, or I tolerate and deal with him. So, today, the whole education system has become stereotyped. And practically, majority of the people in cities wanting to become engineering, doc engineer, doctor, chartered accountant is there. So, the holistic approach needs to be understood. And for that, priority needs to be refocused. But we are happy. They say that in 1991, when economy was liberalized in India, Lakshmi was liberated in 91 in India. Lakshmi got liberated in India in 1991 when the economic policies were reformed. But Saraswati is not yet liberated. So therefore, all the thinkers, and I'm in touch with a lot of people at the center, in the HRD ministry, and with those who are really want, working on these reforms, that in the next two years you could expect a major overhaul in our entire education system and how we approach. And we are hopeful that very soon Saraswati Ji will also be liberated. Thank you so much. I think it's a wonderful talk. Uh, your ABCD principle for self-improvement Fantastic, I think it's the take home is good. Similarly, sustainably in action. Uh, we all say we are knowledge is available, but even in my own experience, two years back I realized what is called single use plastic and plastic. The difference between these two and what we can do. And we eliminated all the plastic in the office and home, etc. Similarly, in terms of kind of a day to day living, what we can do, the people here cannot take back, so that we can make an impact on the earth, not for self. Very good point. You know, uh, we have uh, something in our uh, place called Green Temple Initiative, where we are trying to help people uh, practice sustainability in their own daily lives. In fact, it is one of our dreams that within Mumbai City, we try to create in a few homes. You know, what would be a 100% green home? And just like Eco Village is a place, but most people may think, oh, it's a big institution, you could do it. But like that, create. So, again, simple things. First, food. You cannot live without food. So, therefore, if we can look at food in terms of what will be least damaging to the environment. So if you look, compare between vegetarian and meat-based, then the amount of water which is consumed in running these slaughterhouses is several hundred times. So just by the choice, the conscious choice of the food, you are actually preventing, you know, uh, you are protecting environment by conserving water, just with that. So that is one example. Second, is even within food, if you have a space in your home where you could grow a home garden, because when you come in touch with soil, with earth, 
nothing like having a direct feel. So traditionally in Indian homes, you always had a small patch where at least things like, you know, curry leaves and uh, coriander and various things could be grown. What to speak of anything beyond that? That was like part of that. We never used to buy curry leaves and coriander on from market because it was kind of a small patch was sufficient. And then tulsi was grown and things like that. So every house can potentially have an orchard previously. But now with the city system and the flats and this and that becomes very difficult. But then organic, that's a big debate. So within organic, people feel it is very expensive and this and that. But why it is expensive is because the overall you know, strategy towards farming is not driven in that direction. If we could inspire and encourage policies in such a way that organic farming is more encouraged, then what you get on your table would be healthy food. Otherwise, the kind of diseases, the kind of cancers which are happening due to those choices, and people are innocently consuming, not knowing what goes in the growing of that food. So food in itself is a big topic as far as choice. Second is water. So with water, you, nowadays you get installations by which there is limited water which you can use in the flush and things like that. So one is the sanitation part. Second is in the drinking water element, you could have your own way by which you have filtered water and try to avoid the bottled water and things like that for your personal use. That is very much possible. So all kinds of filtration techniques have become very extent now. I would just like to add to this point. We have around 1,000 to 1,500 community gardens in Singapore because we are a vertical economy. So the government is pushing for community gardens so people can come together, bond and grow together. And also they've introduced uh, five by two plots. You can rent plots to grow your own. So there's a lot of effort here the government is putting to green but we just need to make that effort and step out of our comfort zone. Right. So, you know, as far as water is concerned, a lot of stuff you can do with respect to making sure that you're conscious about the water use. So one is generally 200 to 250 liters is the average Indian consumption of water. You know, so if you are very conscious about that, about how water is being used, then that is also going to go a long way overall. Then energy, use of energy. So for energy, right from the design of the buildings, that energy comes in. So, you know, when we designed our entire eco-village, we brought in Kriha from Terry, Green Rating for Integrated Habitat Assessment. So if natural ventilation natural lighting is integrated as a design feature. So automatically you save on energy. And then of course, if you have to go for air conditioning, then you have all these rated opportunities by which you can reduce the consumption and things like that. But I would say most of the savings you would do based on your lifestyle choices. And that would go a long way in making those differences. So that's just in brief I can share with you. We have limited time. Thank you for your nice question. Yes, please. Namaste, I'm Raj Saxena. You know, Prabhupada's biggest contribution in my view, person very ignorant view, was making ancient Indic wisdom hip and cool, which made it really, really acceptable to me. Now you have, as you said, you know you have the agnostics who are doing yoga, who are doing meditation, who are drinking golden latte, which is essentially handi So you know, they, at some level, uh, you have a whole bunch of people that have imbibed in ancient Indic values and wisdom, but continue to believe that they are agnostics. What impressed me most today, sir, was the fact that um, ancient wisdom and science are supposed to be non-intersecting sets. 
What impressed me most was finding the cusp between the two. It is just my request to you to talk more about this, write more about this, tell us how we can push this narrative further. Because this narrative does not stop at Govardhan or Iskon or whatever it is. This narrative that coexistence is possible uh, through just reinvigorating stuff we already were, you know, we already were supposed to know as a civilization, not as India but as Bharat Varsh. If you could guide us a little bit on how we could help spread the narrative, because it helps each of us individually and then India as a nation and Indians are outside the nation to reclaim a lot of what we have lost ourselves. I don't know if I'm making sense with that yes, question. Yes, thank you. Beautiful. Thanks for that question. And Sachin, what is it? Anurag. Uh, Anurag. The first step, I would say, is you have to take interest in the knowledge itself. Because everything begins with understanding the product. If you do not know what the product is, then you are not excited about it. Right? So therefore, as each one understands what the Gita has to say, or any of these literatures, you know the technology within, then you are in a position to actually share this with others. Right? So therefore, that's something very, very beautiful. Srila Prabhupada, Swami Prabhupada, when he reached London, he was questioned and challenged by one reporter. Why you have come here to London? So he said, well, British, for the last three, four hundred years, they stole many valuable jewels, emerald, rubies, everything from India. But they forgot to steal the most important jewel, the Bhagavad Gita, I have come to give home delivery. <laughs> So you'll be happy to know that in the last 50 years, ISKCON has inspired the distribution of more than 50 crore Bhagavad Gita's across the whole world. That is a step one. That if someone says, I want to know, first the product must be available. So now the Gita has been made very widely available in so many languages. I was just in Africa, I was in Mauritius uh, 10 days ago for a BBT conference, our, that is our publishing house. And in Africa itself, they are having more than thousands of languages. And they are having at least 150 languages translation of all these books in those local African languages and trying to distribute. So therefore, the first, uh, I would say, step is to make the knowledge available. Once the knowledge is available, then you have to have trained the trainers, the teachers who are going to teach this knowledge must be actually trained in the proper way so that they are all on the same page. We are able to understand and appreciate and share this message. Right? So I was at the World Hindu Congress at Chicago just uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, it was organized by Swami Vidyananda and the whole team there. And I was very impressed because this was an effort to bring together people under the Vedic house together there and showcase various possibilities. So I think a very crucial need is the ability for those who are practicing the Hindu tradition under various denominations to be able to come together and still coexist and collaborate in spite of various specific differences which each one of those individual philosophies may have. And I think that's an area where we are lacking big time. And if we have to go to the next level, that would be the kind of collaboration which I would be looking at. Because it's very easy to, you know, find the differences and problems and faults. But very difficult to come together and find what we can do to encourage and empower. You know, I remember I was, we were doing this mega kitchen in Vrindavan many years ago. 2008, we had set it up. 
And so after the fourth or fifth day, when we were cooking food for more than three to four thousand people, one small group of you know devotees came to me and said, "Will you give us an opportunity to cook? We may not be expert, but we are interested to serve." So I said, "Baba, be, be careful because you are cooking for three four thousand people. If you make a mistake." It just cascades. He says, no, no, don't worry. You have to give us a chance. Unless you give us a chance, how will we learn? So I said, okay, fine. I gave them a chance. And then they cooked that day what you know call in Hindi as poha, a chipped rice poha. So they cooked it. They they were new, so they were not experienced in cooking large quantity. The poha turned out to be a little hard. It was not soft. So when I tasted it, I realized today is going to be a hard day for me, <laughs> because three, four thousand people—they don't know who is the one who cooked. They will think I am cooked, and they will give feedback. So I was trying to escape from the side, and then you know there was one devotee who caught hold of me, and he loves giving feedback. <laughs> you know there are some people who are looking where things will go wrong. So he looked at me and said, "What kind of poha you guys cooked? My teeth fell off. It was so hard." I looked at him and said, "That was not poha. That was corn flakes. <laughs> you are supposed to have mixed it with your herbal tea and drunk." He said, "Oh my God, was that corn flakes? You never told me that." I said, "You never asked me that." He got sufficiently confused. I escaped from this. <laughs> so sometimes we have a choice. The same scene. I look at look at it. We are together, or I can look at it say we are different. So it is time that how we are able to harmonize the uniting concepts within those differences, and then when we are able to do that, then practically each Indian who is practitioner of Hinduism becomes an ambassador. of the larger vedic wisdom and still be able to understand process and explain the apparent differences with clarity and with consummate ease but for that the person himself must be aware of what is what otherwise he will be confused in trying to understand and explain both so these are the two things i would like to focus on first make this knowledge widely available and number 2 you create a consciousness by which we are able to appreciate unity in diversity i just want to take this opportunity to uh use the word of thanks as an expression of gratitude to everyone um the word of thanks and everything that we do in life should never be a ritual because otherwise it becomes a formality and if we have the capacity to try and appreciate what we have before us then the word of thanks becomes a very powerful exercise so my first um request uh, from my heart as a word of thanks is to goranga prabhu and i think he deserves a very loud round of applause <laughs> the best way to teach is to act and goranga prabhu today has actually given us an entire understanding of what it means to translate uh, knowledge into action not only is he wonderfully educated in the material world he would have been very very successful if he did not decide to go into spiritual life even in the material world but he has decided that the harmony between matter and spirit is more important and today you have seen that he has actually harnessed matter in a spiritual way so thank you so much prabhu for coming here despite your hectic schedules for sitting down with us for your mastery of sustainability for your amazing way in which you have made a topic which we keep hearing because it's becoming a buzzword and the problem with buzzwords is we become so accustomed to it that we treat it as just another word but thank you for giving us a whole different perspective to it so thank you goranga prabhu to kirti da uh, i have never had the good fortune of meeting you personally until just now 
we have now met, but I've heard so much about you. And even though we had less than half an hour with you on stage, uh, you may not have realized it, but the values that you represent came through the questions you asked. And that is the true measure of passion. That you can moderate a question answer, not give answers, but through your questions, you have provided us so much insight into your own passion for this topic. So we want to thank you very much for your passion. We want to thank Nityo, the representative. Vivek is here. Every year, they come forward. They're so positive in helping us support this event. And we're very grateful to them also. And I think all of us are connected one way or the other, somehow or another, to Rajiv. Am I right? Yes. And what more can we say? Yeah, Rajiv has been the inspiration for Artha Forum around the world. And for those of us who have known him for so many years, he's an inspiration of how one can actually harmonize success in the material world with equal success in the spiritual world. So Rajiv, thank you so much. I also want to thank Suman and his dedicated team. It's so easy for us to see everything in front of us and forget how everything actually came in front of us. And actually Suman and his team whom you see the beauty of it is they are so innocuous in the way they are moving around that we don't notice them. But that's the reason why we should remember them. So thank you so much for being part and making this all possible. <laughs> By profession, I'm a lawyer. So myself and the environment, you know, the legal profession doesn't have so much to do with sustainability. Lawyers tend to break things. Sometimes we break things to mend things. And the problem with lawyers is, you know, we have an answer for everything. Uh, it's not good to get married to a lawyer either. Very difficult, because you should speak to my wife about it. But the environment that we live in is an important place. And whether you come from any profession in the world, you note that the word environment, actually the root of it is French, and it comes from the word surrounding. The more we become aware that who we are will impact the surrounding around us, and the more we become conscious of what the surrounding is around us will affect who we are, that actually begins our journey for environment, sustainability, and being conscious. That's very important. I remember reading from Robert Swan, a very famous author. He said that the greatest threat to our planet is to believe that someone else will save it. And that's the problem sometimes we face. I remember reading from Thomas Fuller, a historian, and he said, we never know the worth of water until the well is dry. And for those of you who have read American history, you know there's a very famous tribe known as the Cree Indians. And they said a very famous thing in the years when uh, America was actually filled with the natives and when the Americas actually became filled with immigrants. The saying says, only when the last tree has died and the last river has been poisoned, and the last, last fish has been caught, will we realize that we cannot really eat money. And that's a powerful point. Srila Prabhupada walked around America, and he said that we can't eat nuts and bolts. We will have to eat and sustain ourselves on something else. And that's what I think we're all gathered here for. To somehow or another put our collective consciousness together to try and find how each and every one of us can actually make a difference. When I was in secondary school, the motto of my school in Singapore was facta non verba. In Latin, translated, it means actions, not words. We can always walk away today after we have food, of course, by saying that we've spoken so much, but what shall we do? Bhishma Dev, a very famous character from the Mahabharata and the Bhagavatam, he said that for us to perform an action, two things must happen before that. One must think about something, then once one must feel about it, and then one can will oneself to do something. So by thinking about sustainability, we begin to feel about sustainability. And then one day at some point, in the right association, as Gorangaji pointed out, we will start willing sustainability. And that is our prayer today, that whatever that we do today should not be a ritual, that we should really go back and we should work. 
And in case you think I'm just one small person in a very big world, don't forget what Mother Teresa said. She said that we know only too well that whatever we are doing is nothing more than a drop in the ocean. And that's needed because that always keeps us humble. That always makes us grounded in the linking process that we call yoga, linking a small portion to a very large portion. But Mother Teresa ended it by saying, if that drop of water was not there, then the ocean would be missing something. It would be missing something. When you see a pearl necklace looking very nice on someone's neck, the pearl looks beautiful, but it is that common thread that's running through the pearl that makes it look good. And if each one of us becomes a link in the chain, then that's the true position of yoga. And that's how yoga and sustainability will come together. Thank you so much for being here. Enjoy the food. Enjoy the company. Go home. Think, feel, and will.